I now have the honor of introducing this year's commencement speaker, Mr. Charlie Day. A few of you may have heard something about Mr. Day. He arrived on our campus from Rhode Island in the fall of 1994, intent on a college experience that included playing varsity baseball. He soon, soon turned his time and talents to other pursuits. As a fine arts student, he was an active participant in the theater productions, and after his graduation in 1998, found himself auditioning for roles on a broader stage. His work in the theater soon brought him to television, and he helped develop and stars in the program It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. And his work on the widescreen has included many well-regarded films. His role today is even more significant. It gives me great honor and pride to welcome to the podium a true son of Merrimack, the college's 64th commencement speaker, Mr. Charlie Day. Good morning, Merrimack. Uh, thank you, President Hopi, um, faculty, trustees, students, parents, grandparents who have absolutely no idea who I am. <laughs> and I would love to say there's nothing more exhilarating than getting to follow a great speech by a Ugandan refugee. <laughs> a terrible position to be in, but I'll do my best. <laughs> and well done, Kennedy. You are graduating from an excellent school today. Alumni have gone on to be CEOs, politicians, professional athletes. However, this year, you will get to receive wisdom, life lessons, knowledge from a man who's made a living pretending to eat cat food. <laughs> now, I do, however, have some qualifications, some insight, because like you, are becoming today, I'm a Merrimack College graduate. Thank you. I know what it took to get here today. I was in this very room. I sat in those uncomfortable chairs. I dressed like some sort of medieval pastry chef. And I too desperately hoped that my hangover would wear off. Yeah, that one knows. If you can just make it to brunch, you'll be all right. But take note, a quick observation today. Apparently, the higher you climb in life, the more ridiculous your hats will become. <laughs> like the one I'm wearing today, or the Pope, or Pharrell. <laughs> so if some way you fear success, just think of the hats. That should motivate you. Well, this may be hard, hard to believe, but it was uh, roughly 20 years ago that as a freshman I came to this campus. I remember it well, my parents who are here today, and I'm not thanking my mother as much as Kennedy did, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I remember the tears in their eyes, I remember my own nervous excitement. I can recall entering the, dash, the Ash dormitory, walking to the, my, thank, yeah, there they are, walking to my room, my heart was pounding with what the future might hold. I grabbed onto the door handle, I held it tight, only to discover that someone had covered it with Vaseline. It was a real lame prank by the third floor boys. And I thought to myself, okay, this is how it's gonna be here. They have no idea who just arrived at campus. <laughs> Later that day, I befriended a man named Ed who had a similar passion for mischievousness. And that night, Ed and I went to the third floor boys' community bathrooms and we cut all the shower curtains at waist high. That's right. Leaving those boys with a diabolical option for the next morning. Don't take a shower or take the most embarrassing shower of your life. My apologies to the school for destruction of, uh, destruction of school property. I promise to donate two shower curtains. We'll have to dig up Ed to get the third. Well, Merrimack has come a long way since my time. The campus has grown, the quality of student clearly improved. U.S. News and World Report has ranked Merrimack uh, one of the top ten regional colleges in the Northeast. Well done. Well done. 
In my time, there was a man here who scored in the zero percentile on his SATs. <laughs> Meaning no one in the nation did worse than this man. This is a man who once told someone he wished he lived when it was black and white. This is the same man who said to someone with complete seriousness that he would take their advice into cooperation. <laughs> this man, of course, was my roommate. <laughs> Did you think it was me? No, you're, you're confusing me with my television character. No, I'm much smarter. In fact, I'm a doctor now. <laughs> I have a PhD. And I would like to thank the school for bestowing me with this prestigious honor. And although I realize today I am joining the ranks of my fellow honorary doctors like Mike Tyson <laughs> and Kermit the Frog, and although I acknowledge that Dr. Charlie Day sounds like some sort of club DJ, <laughs> I assure you I intend to go by this title from now on. And I plan to begin writing my own prescriptions immediately. <laughs> All right, now, I know that having an honorary doctorate degree will do nothing for me. But I am here to tell you today that your degrees, the ones you toiled to get, the ones you actually took classes to earn, those degrees will also basically do nothing. <laughs> Let me clarify that. You cannot exchange your degree for cash. You cannot have your degree do an audition or interview for you. You cannot eat it. Please do not make love to it. I think you could probably smoke it, but I wouldn't advise it. <laughs> a college degree does nothing. It collects dust. It does, however, mean something. It tells something to your community. <clears throat> it says, I have expanded my mind and destroyed my liver, but I didn't give up. <laughs> and although 44 of you here today took more than four years to accomplish that goal, you don't have to tell anyone that. There they are. Think of the plus side. You bought your parents a few extra years of nobody living in their basement. <laughs> now, all jokes aside, you should be very proud. This is an impressive chapter of your lives. And I know you're curious of what will happen from here. So let me tell you, Dr. DJ is here to help. <laughs> I have been in your shoes. Not literally, of course. I wouldn't go anywhere near your shoes. I'm sure they all reek of beer and vomit. <laughs> but my point is this. I was in this room, and this is a rare opportunity for me to say something to myself 20 years ago. Here's my advice. Charlie, lay off the dark beer and bread. You're getting puffy. <laughs> Don't worry about that girl. I mean, she's not into you. Let it go. She's going to regret it. <laughs> yep. That's right. There's going to be a whole Y2K thing. Don't worry about it. Like, nothing's going to happen. <laughs> All right, now I realize this isn't the most useful exercise for you, but I'm pretty happy with the choices I made after Merrimack. My life is pretty sweet. <laughs> so I'd like to tell you three quick stories about some of those choices I made when I left here, some of the things that led me from that chair to this podium. And I hope in some way you can draw parallels from it that can help guide your own experience. If not, feel free to tune out. If you're anything like I was, I lost you at Good Morning Merrimack. <laughs> when I left this school, I was presented with two options. I could move to New York City and begin my acting career, a city where I knew next to no one, or I could take the entry-level position that had been offered to me by Fidelity Investments. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why would a major financial services corporation offer this numbskull a job? The answer is simple. Because I tricked them. Merrimack's business program was offering interviews with the company. The students would be given a score on their interview, and I'd never been on an audition. It seemed like it would be a similar experience, and I liked the role of aspiring banker, or whatever they do at Fidelity. I had a game plan. Deflect from me. Get this guy to talk about himself. I wasn't going to lie. I was just basically going to interview him. If I recall correctly, we talked at length about the intricacies of water skiing an activity I know nothing about. Now, had the man asked me what eight times seven was, there would have been an unbearable pause in the room. <laughs> but he didn't, and the interview went so well that he offered me a job. And this was a real job. I'm sorry I'm making your children cry. 
This was a real job. This was a big boy job. And this, this threw me for a loop. Should I take this job? Is this my destiny? Am I the next great financial genius? Should I come up with a plan B? Should I work in Boston for a few years and make enough money to have a cozy transition to New York? Well, I have always had a half-baked philosophy that having a plan B can muddy up your plan A. I didn't take the job. I moved to the city. I bust tables. I lived in a basement apartment next to a garbage chute that was filled with cockroaches. And I could not have made a better decision. Well, maybe not the apartment thing. I, I think I could have looked a little longer. <laughs> You'll find better apartments. Stay away from the trash area. <laughs> now, there's an obvious lesson here about believing in yourself or uh, the plan A, plan B stuff. Excuse me while I navigate this thing. <laughs> but I think the lesson is this. Had I worked at, at Fidelity, I am sure they would have fired me eventually. <laughs> I can barely do long division. But I didn't want to fail at Fidelity. And I did not want to fail in Boston. If I was going to run the risk of failure, I wanted it to be in the place where I would be proud to fail, doing what I wanted to do. And let me tell you something, I did fail over and over again. I was too short for this or too weird for that. I had one casting agent say, this man will never work in comedy. But I was in the fight. I was taking my punches, but I was in the fight. That is a metaphor, of course. I don't think I have any actual ability to take a punch. <laughs> now, my second story is about creating your own opportunities instead of waiting for them to be handed to you. After a few years in New York, my foot was in the door. I was doing pretty prestigious parts like Mailroom Kid 1 and Junkie 2. <laughs> but after many failed attempts at getting cast in a television show, something popped up. It looked as though I was going to be offered a job on a big network television program called Life on a Stick. Now, around the same time, because I was tired of waiting for my break to just happen, I, along with my friend Rob McElhenney and Glenn Howerton, started filming my own television show in my apartment. I had a sense that maybe I could create an opportunity that was better than the ones that were being given to me. So I borrowed cameras, I had friends hold microphones, and we shot a show in our apartments that we were going to call It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Thank you. Now suddenly there was another decision to be made, another crossroad. Do I do life on a stick? Do I take this big network television opportunity? Or do I make another bet on myself, and this time on my friends as well? Do I make no money? Do I try to sell a home movie as the next great television series? I mean, I was trying to tell people I was a writer and I didn't even own a personal computer. Now, this was a risky bet, a real long shot. But I said no to a life on a stick, and I went with Sonny. Life on a stick went one season in 13 episodes. We are currently filming our 10th season of Sonny. We've written and produced 114 episodes. We're signed on for another two years, making It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia one of the longest-running comedies of all time. Thank you. Thank you. Again, a bet on myself, and this time on my friend. No, you don't want this. This will be better. I've earned it. <laughs> this time, a bet on myself. That's, that's not better. <clears throat> and a bet on my friends as, self, as, as well paid off. It paid off in spade. There was power in numbers. And Sonny changed my life. Not only did I have a career as an actor and a writer now, I had complete control over everything I wanted to do. If I wanted to dress in a full-body green spandex suit, it went in the show. If I wanted to drink Coke, a wine out of a Coke can, as perhaps some of you are doing right now, it went in the show. And if I had a weird idea about putting mittens on kittens, it went in the show. This was the riskier road, but I could not have made a better decision. Sonny changed my life, and it led to everything. Horrible Bosses, Pacific Rim, Saturday Night Live. Thank you. <laughs> Creating the job as opposed to waiting, it, waiting for it to be offered to me was the way to go. Now, I think there's an obvious lesson here. Don't wait for your break. Make your break. Go make it happen for yourself. All right, one last story, and then I'm out of here. The last story of what led me from there to here is the literal act of agreeing to be here today. 
When President Hobie came to sit down with me in Los Angeles, my first thought was, here it comes. They're going to ask me for money. <laughs> yeah, they haven't yet, thank God. <laughs> but when he asked me to speak to you today, I, I happily accepted. And then, as is the case with all great opportunities, the reality of what I had to do began to set in. Dear God, the kid's still crying. <laughs> People are laughing and the kid's crying. I'm worried about that one. <laughs> Dear God, I said to myself, I'm going to have to actually give a speech. I am not a public speaker. I have a voice like a 10-year-old who smokes. <laughs> How am I going to do this? I YouTube commencement speeches given by Conan O'Brien, Stephen Colbert, Steve Jobs. This was a terrible idea. <laughs> Their speeches were so intelligent, so well-informed, so eloquent, that only more panic began to set in. What am I thinking? How could I ever compare? And the truth is, I can't. I don't host a talk show or do stand-up. As an actor, normally you have cut away from me a long time ago. Now, I'm not nearly as smart as Steve Jobs. I don't know how my computer works. I don't even know how my toaster works. <laughs> and the YouTube comments. Oh, the world of snarky comments we're living in. And perhaps that's the most terrifying thing of all, that what we do now is permanent. But I didn't back out. I'm here speaking to you today. And I know I will be judged by all those who care to watch on YouTube and compared, but my lesson is this. I don't give a shit, <laughs> okay? I'm sorry. Now listen up. You cannot let a fear of failure, or a fear of comparison, or a fear of judgment stop you from doing what's going to make you great. You cannot succeed without this risk of failure. You cannot have a voice without the risk of criticism. And you cannot love without the risk of loss. You must go out and you must take these risks. Everything I'm truly proud of in this life has been a terrifying prospect to me. From my first play, to hosting Saturday Night Live, to getting married, to being a father, to speaking to you today. None of it comes easy. And people will tell you to do what makes you happy. But a lot of this has been hard work. And I'm not always happy. And I don't think you should do just what makes you happy. I think you should do what makes you great. Do what's uncomfortable and scary and hard but pays off in the long run. Be willing to fail. Let yourself fail. Fail in the way, in the place where you would want to fail. Fail, pick yourself up, and fail again. Because without this struggle, what is your success anyway? Look, as best we know it, we have one life. In it, you have to trust your own voice, your own ideas, your honesty, your vulnerability, and through this you will find your way. You do not have to be fearless. Just don't let fear stop you. Live like this as best you can, and I guarantee you will look back on a life well lived. You are capable of greatness in your profession, and more importantly, in your quality of self. Stay hungry. Stay young at heart. Take those risks. You are going to change the world around you in big ways and in small. And I greatly look forward to being a part of the future that you will shape. Congratulations, graduates, and good luck. <laughs>